Welcome to the 10th episode of Complete Liberty Podcast. My name is Wes Bertrand, and this podcast has been dedicated to creating an audiobook of my book, Complete Liberty, The Demise of the State and the Rise of Voluntary America, published 2007. The last podcast we covered chapter 9, and this one will cover the final chapter of the book, as well as the addendum, important IAQ, infrequently asked questions. So let's proceed. Chapter 10. Live Freely and Not Die In Search of the Governed's Consent Article 3. That Government is, or ought to be, instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community. Of all the various modes and forms of government that is best, which is capable of producing the greatest degree of happiness and safety, and is most effectually secured against the danger of maladministration, and that, whenever any government shall be found inadequate or contrary to these purposes, a majority of the community hath an indubitable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish it, in such manner as shall be judged most conducive to the public weal. Article 14 that the people have a right to uniform government, and therefore that no government separate from or independent of the government of Virginia ought to be erected or established within the limits thereof. George Mason, Virginia Declaration of Rights. Article 3 above probably reminds you of Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence. Indeed, Thomas saw no need to reinvent the political wheel in these matters, both his and Mason's idea was to emphasize that government should be designed to serve the interests of the people, rather than the people existing to serve the interests of government. Clearly, it didn't take long for this idea to become reversed. Each man was well aware of this possibility, which explains why they were quick to mention that if government turns into some kind of monster, the people have an indubitable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish it, according to the welfare of the community. Now, we've seen how the idea of monopolistic government leads directly to lack of choices and coercive control of the citizenry. In Article 14 above, Mason falsely assumed that a legalized monopoly of government is the way for law to be uniform and equitable. Maybe he believed that such a coercive monopoly would be easier to control and more servile than independent or separate governments. Yet to authorize an organization to have sole power over the affairs of a group of people immediately ignores those who would rather be left alone or organize their own methods of governance. Centralized, collectivistic governance, in fact, lacks legal authority because it defies the nature of agency and voluntary contracts. Remember, government isn't the end. People's security is. Individuals and their decision-making capacities precede any notions of government. Only an ideology based on collectivism views people as a herd and disregards individuals. Collectivism seeks to corral people into a system of governance not of their choosing. This, of course, exposes the basic misunderstanding of how government actually works. Notions such as common benefit and public weal create a sense of universality or mutual bond but in reality they belie the nature of how persons and communities, be they towns, cities, states, or nations, interact. Individuals, by the hundreds, thousands, and millions, make countless choices in the marketplace of products, services, values, ideas, and relationships. To speak of their general welfare really means to speak of the total sum of each person's needs and context something that no coercive, monopolistic government can ever hope to ascertain. Only when unanimity exists, based on sound principles, can one speak in broad, community-wide terms. The idea that safety and security for people can and should be provided by a single organization called government, even if funded voluntarily, is analogous to mandating a single provider of food, water, and shelter for everyone. Imagine the chaos and chronic shortages resulting from that scenario. The grim history of communism saves us the trouble of imagining it. Obviously, every sane person wants safety and security for themselves and their loved ones. That's incontrovertible. So, the main question is this. How do we enable the satisfaction of each person's safety and security? This is the question that the framers faltered on, and obviously most people today continue to falter on. 
Essentially, they assumed the conclusion that government exists, therefore we must have government, and they constructed a political system around that faulty conclusion, paying no attention to its negation of individual rights. We certainly know that individuals exist, so it's most wise to begin a political system with that assumption. Embracing this simple fact leads us directly to the conclusion that individuals must be free to construct any political system of their choosing, so long as it doesn't violate individual rights. As we discovered, the only system capable of respecting individual rights is a market-based one. This conclusion follows from the nature of voluntary contracts. Again, each of us is free to contract with whomever we like and trust. Just as importantly, each of us is free not to contract with whomever we don't like and don't trust. Rather than leading to criminality, chaos, confusion, and shortages, rather than leading to a disintegration of community standards and a proliferation of vices, enterprising individuals in the marketplace work to ensure that people get what they want and remain satisfied, so they become repeat customers. When given the choice, people tend to gravitate to those goods and services that they most value. They pay for only what they want, and they get only what they pay for. A la carte ordering writ large. Most people take these economic rights to trade for granted, at least where the state hasn't coerced them to do otherwise. All we have to do is apply this same principle to politics. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach to government that maintains itself by initiatory force and prevention of choices, the marketplace can provide myriad ways to ensure your safety and security, all without any extra costs or unwanted aspects, which are always unavoidable with the state. Changes in many points of view Given the current nature of politics in America, not to mention the rest of the world, how likely is it that most people will become more aware and work to change things dramatically for the better? How likely is it that people will discard entrenched power structures and stagnant institutions and replace them with rights-respecting marketplace providers of formerly governmental services? Well, the answers to these questions depend primarily on how many people are exposed to these new political ideas and new ways of thinking about themselves and their rights, that is, new to them. The ideas have been around for quite a while. Yet being exposed to these ideas is one thing, acting on them is another, which again raises the issue of integrity. Most people still abide by a political morality that allows for, or rather mandates, the initiation of force instead of retaliatory force. Of course, morality is intimately tied to psychological processes, to feelings and subconscious thoughts. Any change in point of view, then, requires moving the rest of the psychological mountain. Most people feel that they have only a shovel with which to work, rather than heavy earth-moving equipment. Such a feeling can trick them into thinking that the status quo is easier and preferable to revolutionary change. A change in point of view can indeed seem daunting. It may require that we restructure not just our belief system, but also our friendships, family relationships, jobs, work relations, voting habits, specifically the habit of voting itself, and so on. But it's basically a problem of psychological and moral inertia, which must be acted upon by something sufficiently provocative, such as better ideas and self-generated behaviors, as well as inspiring actions of others. If left unchallenged, our present political opinions shaped by the state might continue for many more centuries, just like humanity has plodded along politically since time immemorial. We must come to realize that government is a detrimental burden, not the benefactor of the community, state, and nation. It doesn't create law and order. It creates a seemingly permanent, insidious form of societal chaos. All of us are slowly dying from government, failing to actualize our full potential as members of an advanced civilization on a marvelous biosphere. Government continues to make a mockery of our self-actualization abilities as individuals, as adults, and as a society. This takes us back to remedies. Each of us can disseminate our knowledge as widely as possible in any particular style deemed most effective that free trade applies to all forms of peaceable human interaction. Governmental services should be no exception to the rule of voluntarism. To make such an exception is to create a colossally inconsistent form of morality, which is only possible by abandoning rationality when it's most needed, when it pertains to how we treat each other politically. 
In addition to spreading the good words of freedom and rationality, we can also direct our efforts at strategic projects. Persons who really value liberty can't accept the status quo. The possible future civilization and their lives in it is much too glorious. No matter how many stand against them or how many sit on the sidelines, individuals will continue to attempt to subdue or restrain the elements of statism they believe are most harmful to our lives and well-being. In America today, there are numerous libertarian organizations and think tanks that focus on specific political and economic issues, which exist on both the state and federal levels. They address such things as ending drug prohibition, separating education from the state, privatizing it, rectifying property rights violations by the state, repealing taxes and regulations, and holding Congress more accountable for the bills they pass but seldom read. DownsizedDC.org makes the last their signature issue with their proposed Read the Bills Act. Each voting season, many groups pressure politicians, get petitions signed for candidates. Propose bills and ballot measures or propositions, and request referendums. Some research is usually required to determine the viability and effectiveness of each cause. In the end, however, most of these activities still entail playing the game of politics. Democracy abides by the unfair and convoluted rules of statism, not the simple principles of liberty. This partially explains why so many millions of Americans. Aren't interested and motivated to support such campaigns. Public choice theory demonstrates why it's so difficult to change a democracy into a system of liberty by playing politics. The individual cost of fighting a particular special interest issue is often much higher than the potential individual rewards concerning a favorable outcome on that issue. The modus operandi of special interests and governmental services in general is to disperse the costs. And concentrate the benefits. That way, few persons who incur part of the dispersed costs will make much fuss, and the people who directly benefit will get their way. Additionally, entrenched, influential, and vocal countervailing groups are adept at running campaigns of dishonesty, misinformation, disinformation, and other types of unseemly propaganda, which can frustrate even the best of libertarian causes. Public choice theory also notes that politicians are motivated by self-interest as much as the average person. Therefore, we should harbor no collectivistic delusions about the nature of the political game. Needless to say, those with vested interests in the use of coercion fool themselves and others about the effects of their victories. They destroy widespread opportunities for everyone while establishing narrow benefits for few, and eventually, even those benefits will disappear. Instead of playing the game of politics and trying to do damage control, we must stop giving the state our sanction. There is no substitute for a populace informed about the true nature of government and the vital alternatives of self-ownership, reason, and choice. Without such political wisdom, at best, we'll continue to take one step forward and then be pushed two or three steps backward. Statism will continue to be the dominant theme in America. Until more people begin to realize the immense importance of their individual lives, pundits will continually rehash typical topics regarding the next president and dominant party in Congress, the nature of Supreme Court members and their past and future rulings, the policies of the new Federal Reserve Board Chairman Ben Bernanke, and so on. On this last issue, it's a safe bet that he'll continue Alan Greenspan's dangerous monetary policies. And drive our governmentally constructed Titanic toward even worse icebergs in the years ahead. But my goodness, what nice deck chair arrangements! On the federal level, we face sizable problems indeed. However, each state has its own particular set of serious snafus. How much does all this matter in the grand scheme of things, in regard to the ideas of liberty? Not a whole lot. Better ideas, because they're grounded in reason and reality, will ultimately win. Thanks to the internet, there's just too much access to good information at this stage for bad ideas and actions to overwhelm us. With any luck, the complete liberty memes will spread quickly enough to soften the various blows that the state is known to deliver to economies, both national and local. Liberty-oriented radio shows and podcasts, such as Free Talk Live, freetalklive.com, can definitely help matters. Introducing people to truthful alternatives to politics as usual will certainly speed up our social evolution. First, free a state. 
But is there a way to greatly accelerate the spread and implementation of liberty memes? There definitely is, by concentrating them in a specific geographical region. Fortunately, a project to do this is already underway, the New Hampshire Free State Project. Indeed, I've saved the best for last. Just when you think that you'll have to wait an interminable amount of time before we can ever begin to uproot the tree of governmental coercion and step into the life-giving sunlight of a new age, along comes a quicker way. I hereby state my solemn intent to move to the state of New Hampshire. Once there, I will exert the fullest practical effort toward the creation of a society in which the maximum role of civil government is the protection of life, liberty, and property. Statement of Intent, Free State Project, freestateproject.org. Granted, after reading this far, the idea of civil government protecting us probably rings a bit hollow. Nonetheless, this idea follows from the Founding Fathers' classical liberal notions, which are arguably better than the notions of most of their descendants. Whether or not a so-called civil government is a significant step towards a liberty-oriented society, any government that taxes, regulates, and enforces monopolies truly demonstrates its highly uncivil nature. Such a criminal organization is unfit for a free people. And, you might ask, isn't a free state an oxymoron? Indeed it is. Any state, by definition, is antithetical to the principle of individual sovereignty and human choice. Nonetheless, just as groups of people historically have seceded from overarching nation-states, secession of the individual from aggressive, federal, state, and local governments is part of the process of attaining complete liberty. Given the vast expanse of the United States, the seeds of freedom must be planted somewhere. New Hampshire's ground is arguably more fertile than most, for it remains one of the least oppressive states in America, if not the least. And for what it's worth, it's one of the original 13 colonies. Most importantly, the region within its borders, like anywhere else in the Union, can become privately owned, thereby dissolving its borders into simply the jurisdiction of property owners, both commercial and private. Additionally, its many state services can be replaced with voluntary ones. Because Free State Project members and potential members represent a whole ideological range of liberty lovers, full agreement at the outset about the real nature of government would prove difficult. For example, some members who advocate limited government seem to be comforted by the thought of having a smaller form of tyranny, a reduced malignant tumor, if you will, even though the state's assumed control of roads and general infrastructure always reveals its metastasized nature. In turn, many believe that playing politics can yield good results. Such beliefs and behaviors may be the central reason why the Libertarian Party, on both national and state levels, hasn't gained much cultural ground over the last 30-plus years, since the party's inception. Principles are powerful things, especially when individuals stick to them. Thus, it behooves every Libertarian to fully understand the principles of liberty and apply them consistently. There's no need to compromise in these matters. Compromise only begets more of the same. We can't get rid of the insuperable problems of politics by playing more politics, that is, by obeying unjust laws and following inane rules. No liberty-minded person can satisfy the demands of governmental workers who systematically commit unjust acts and promote immoral ideas. Moreover, it's impossible to vote for rulers who aren't authorized to rule over us. Simply put, we can't live freely as rights-respecting, autonomous adults by respecting the traditions and policies of disrespectful organizations. By and large, voters see the control of other people's lives and property as worthwhile. They believe in taxation, regulation, welfare, and war in their various forms, based on a whole host of misguided premises, as well as fears. Voters and candidates alike accept the nature of the political process, coercion, and think or feel that it can bestow good things upon them. To expect them to begin voting with a libertarian mindset contradicts the very reason for voting in the first place. Swing voters are often the focus of campaigns, which follows from the notion that you can appeal to people's better judgment through sound bites and big names on street corner signs. I'm pretty sure it doesn't get much more nonsensical than this. Is it possible to liberate ourselves from the pernicious effects of voting by engaging in the same process? Is it wise to follow inane political rules in the hope of getting rid of them? Furthermore, can we expect non-voters to begin voting for principled libertarians who are set on abolishing the very institution in which they're seeking office? 
People who don't vote either want nothing to do with politics, or they're too busy trying to live their lives to pay attention to how politics is oppressing them. Either way, they rightly see voting as pointless. They always lose, and politics always wins. Status wolves will never turn down fine meals of individual sheep. Lastly, since limited government or small government libertarians apparently don't want to dispense with fantasies of benevolent or benign statism, their compromised arguments will always succumb to the more consistent arguments of their statist competitors. Simply put, liberty and the state don't mix. What we need is not watered-down statism, but rather fully drowned statism. Let it sink to the bottom of the corrupt pond of politics and be covered with the darker notes of history. When people realize the state's true nature, voting is no longer necessary. Politicians and voting are then seen for what they are: ways to infringe on individual rights and personal sovereignty. Nevertheless, whether they desire to dive right into the clear and refreshing pool of freedom, or to ease in from the shallow end, most Free State Project members agree that no one has the right to forestall the progression toward a society of liberty. The faster it can be implemented. The faster people can begin living according to reason rather than force, Americans need not be fearful of major political changes for the better. As our semi-fascist, semi-communist state continues to confront us, as well as our loved ones, our friends, our acquaintances, our co-workers, our associates, and our fellow traders, we ought not continue to comply. Terrible police state history need not repeat itself. Remember. We far outnumber those who seek to oppress us, and so they need our sanction in order to continue perpetrating their acts of coercion. Granted, nearly all of us have been inculcated by state-run schools in a culture of self-sacrifice and blind obedience to authority, so we tend to easily accept a very diluted formulation of liberty. It's definitely way past time to reassess our education and behavior in these matters. Eventually, everyone will reflect on the nature of their political and moral education, because we still have residual elements of the Enlightenment in America, perhaps more so than any other place on the planet. These elements will enable everybody to embrace complete liberty ideas at some point in their future. The Free State Project simply aims to gather and unite persons who already understand libertarianism and hence want some semblance of liberty as soon as possible. It thus becomes a potent catalyst for change. The greater the concentration of highly motivated, freedom-oriented activists in a single state, especially a state as small as New Hampshire, the faster the principles of liberty can be promoted and adopted. Remember, liberty, like smiling, is contagious. Now, certainly, there are various people in New Hampshire who harbor unwarranted fears about the principles of liberty and those who seek to enact them, just like the rest of America. Some journalists and politicians, and even residents, have expressed at most lukewarm acceptance and, at worst, outright disapproval of New Hampshire being chosen as the free state in 2003. Evidently, they don't take the state's motto "Live free or die" as seriously as the man who penned it in 1809, General John Stark. Upon moving here in the spring of 2006, I spent some time at the state capitol in Concord to observe the sausage being made there. All my suspicions were confirmed. Essentially, much like other states, representatives and officials, city and town governments too, create reams of legislation and legal minutia that they translate into decisions about what to do with other people's property, as well as about management of state and local governments. As usual, individuals are sacrificed to the collective for the good of the people. Such an experience definitely exposes the inconsistency between New Hampshire's bold motto and its mind-numbing bureaucratic system. In case you're wondering, the state senate passed and amended a whole host of new bills. One of them created a commission to study whether state representatives should be lackeys to D.C.'s mandate to implement a national ID card or real ID, essentially an internal passport system, which remains a favorite of police states everywhere. To keep us all safe from terrorists, of course. Visit freestateblogs.net and nhliberty.org for assorted sausage-making updates. Naturally, some who are concerned about how libertarian ideas will alter the current state of affairs might ask, "Why us? Who do these people think they are, seeking to change the state of New Hampshire?" Greek mythology may provide a poetic answer for them. 
The Free State Project is symbolic of Hercules releasing Prometheus from his bondage by Zeus. Once freed, Prometheus can again bring great talents and achievements to humankind. This time he brings us ideas that will put all of Pandora's evils back in their box. In doing so, a totally free market will be a godsend for every person fortunate enough to experience it. Aside from various New Hampshire residents who may be reticent to welcome complete liberty, there are countless others who are and will be greatly inspired. All those who are disenchanted with politics can join the campaign to institute personal freedom and total respect for property as a lifestyle. Interestingly, even the architects of the New Hampshire State Constitution proposed a way out of an unacceptable predicament. Article 10. Right to Revolution. Government being instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the whole community and not for the private interest or emolument of any one man, family, or class of men. Therefore, whenever the ends of government are perverted and public liberty manifestly endangered, and all other means of redress are ineffectual, the people may, and of right, ought to reform the old or establish a new government. The doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. June 2, 1784, New Hampshire State Constitution the last sentence clearly summarizes the idea that government is created to serve the people, and when the people are instead forced to serve government via special interest legislation, regulation, and taxation, it's incumbent upon the oppressed to do something about it. But taking political action, whether through redress, reform, or reconstruction, must be grounded in sound principles that respect individual rights. By that standard, then, Various words and phrases in Article 10 provoke some rigorous analysis. Who exactly instituted the government, and what are its specified ends? What are the means and methods by which common benefit, protection, and security are bestowed on the whole community? What does public liberty really mean, and when exactly is it endangered? Furthermore, what are the people's values and virtues, and what is the nature of their consent? Such questions focus on the inherent contradiction in government trying to be all things to all persons. Few, if any, persons who accept the state can ever agree on just where to draw the line concerning the public good and the desired ends of government. Nevertheless, they normally agree on how government operates and acquires its resources. Article 12. Protection and Taxation Reciprocal Every member of the community has a right to be protected by it, in the enjoyment of his life, liberty, and property. He is therefore bound to contribute his share in the expense of such protection, and to yield his personal service when necessary. But no part of a man's property shall be taken from him, or applied to public uses, without his own consent, or that of the representative body of the people. Nor are the inhabitants of this state controllable by any other laws than those to which they or their representative body have given their consent. June 2, 1784, New Hampshire State Constitution. Certainly, each person living in a community has the right to be left alone by others, others who may even desire to infringe on the enjoyment of one's life, liberty, and property. This follows from your right to self-defense, which reflects self-ownership, and hence your freedom to stop others from initiating force against you. Naturally, it follows that each person must bear the expense in preventing and dealing with such rights violations, though the aggressor must pay in the end. No one possesses a right to governmental services at taxpayers' expense. As mentioned earlier, purchasing insurance policies through a reputable agent will be a good way to deal with these kinds of potential expenses. It definitely doesn't follow that the process of rights protection should be monopolized, and that persons in the community should be forced, bound, to contribute money and even labor, personal service when necessary. That would be in violation of their right to contract. Each person retains the right to contract, or not, with any particular form of protection from rights violators. Apparently that's why the framers of the New Hampshire Constitution inserted the invaluable statement, no part of a man's property shall be taken from him or applied to public uses without his own consent. An individual's property can be taken and applied to public uses only when that person consents. Unfortunately, 
these framers didn't stop there. They allowed for consent also to be given, supposedly on behalf of the individual, by the representative body of the people. As is the case in any constitutional republic, such representatives are definitely not chosen legal agents, acting in a voluntary fashion. The individual hasn't authorized them to act on his or her behalf. Rather, representatives usurp individual rights and property from people in the name of the public good, which often means satisfying a variety of agendas of the powerful, influential, and vocal. It's back to special interests once again. No collectivistic project on earth is so important that it requires stealing the property of individuals in order to further itself. Without consent, there can be no willing trade. Without voluntary exchange, there can be no rational interaction. These are the basic facts that politically minded people throughout history have tried to ignore, and even ridicule, at the cost of their self-respect and humanity. We know that democratic votes or town hall meetings don't equal consent, for there will always be at least one individual who disagrees. Curiously, only under dictatorships is unanimity achieved. When it comes to acquiring and utilizing another's property, there is no logical or moral substitute for consent and voluntary trade. This is the case regardless of the size of the geographical area or the population. Towns aren't exempt from these observations merely because government may be more accessible or closer to the people. Collectivistic political theft of someone's property is no different in principle than individual theft. Typically, as Lysander Spooner noted for us, the only distinction is that the individual thief doesn't attempt to deny that his action is theft, and he doesn't try to justify his theft through references to the common good, general welfare, public interest, community, and the well-being of children. If you've ever witnessed the goings-on of local politics, you're no doubt familiar with the amount of deception of self and others and context dropping that's exercised. Mayoral elections, city council and school board meetings, zoning and planning commissions, legislative proceedings, etc., all demonstrate what happens when people have access to a community chest of tax dollars and regulatory powers. They zealously rule over others to deal with the needs of the people. Of course, the very last need on the list, in truth, it's not even on the list, is to respect the rights of the individual, the smallest, most persecuted minority in the world. The only way to reverse this perverse situation is for enough people to consider it worth reversing, band together, and get to work on changing politics as usual. That's why the Free State Project holds such promise, why liberty in our lifetime will become more than its marketing slogan. It will be made real. Focused effort by liberty-minded activists in New Hampshire is much better than scattered effort across a whole nation. How many people are necessary? Judging by what I've seen, heard, and discussed with others, as well as the progress of the few hundred already in the state, a thousand more will probably make a sizable impact. Hence, the Free State Project's First 1000 pledge. freestateproject.org slash first 1000 whose signers have pledged to move to New Hampshire before 2009. A group that's devoted strictly to liberty agendas and laissez-faire policies can be a major motivator and inspiration for everybody. Unlike special interests, this resonates with the silent majority who are disgusted with politics and politicians. If the over 7,500 current FSP members, as of 107, were to move to New Hampshire as soon as possible, rather than wait for the membership to hit 20,000, that would be something to behold. It could seriously weaken the walls of the statist house of cards. We must keep in mind that reason and reality are on the side of freedom, and so is morality. The state government is winning, more or less, by default. Similar to other states in America, and in D.C., anti-liberty lobbyists influence politicians and governmental officials on a daily basis. It's business as usual, following from public choice theory, Similar to other states, too, most of the non-voting as well as many of the voting public aren't very informed about what's actually happening on the floors of the legislature. Given its mind-numbing quality, it's hard to blame them. Some people vote for their slate of Democrats or Republicans as if they were opposing sports teams, but ones that aggress against innocent bystanders. The lesser of two evils mentality also runs rampant. 
Most base their choices on age-old notions of what constitutes good government, which reflects the necessary evil premise of the state, the same one Thomas Paine unfortunately extolled. The press, as usual, is composed predominantly of statist intellectuals. So what little information the public gets is definitely not the whole story. The Keen Free Press, keenfreepress.com, however, is a new and very refreshing exception. In New Hampshire, each town has relative autonomy in many governmental aspects. Counties are not as politically significant as in other states, which has its libertarian benefits. Some free staters will work on freeing various towns and cities first, and then the entire state. A multi-pronged approach will probably prove most effective. Whether it's the work of the first 1,000 members or the first 20,000 members, to say that the project will change the political and economic landscape for the better would be an understatement. There are no losers in the creation of liberty because it's the only way to an environment in which everyone's person and property and rationality are fully respected. Free staters and their supporters can tackle any number of essential issues. Privatizing education and other public service monopolies will restore quality service and help end state ownership and control of one's property via the taxes imposed on it. Dispensing with health care regulations and licensure, as in any other industry, will dramatically reduce both entrepreneurial costs and consumer prices, as well as significantly increase quality and quantity of services. Ending federal and state agencies' violations of personal freedoms, like drug use, will foster self-responsibility and greatly reduce crime, police violence and corruption, and health hazards. Implementing a plan, for instance based on homesteading, to privatize state-owned and managed land, water, and airspace will ensure legal accountability, efficient use of resources, admirable stewardship, and enforcement of a cleaner environment, as well as generate vast economic opportunities, noticeably benefiting everyone. Instituting a money-backed currency, for instance of gold or silver, will expose Federal Reserve notes as the humongous sham they are. A sound free market medium of exchange will bestow mighty financial blessings on the populace. Clearly, this just covers some of the high points. Free staters, with the help of an invigorated grassroots movement of like-minded people, can address many other pertinent issues. Of course, as mentioned, some people will resist these agendas. The mindless collective turns out to be the same, no matter where one lives. It ignores individuals and sees only the needs and behavior of groups and the misbehavior of individuals who defy it. It only sees others who can be molded into its image and likeness, a dependent, faceless mass of humanity that conforms to the public will, that is, those in control of state power. People involved in politics at the state, county, city, or town levels are typically not friendly to independent thought and actions. They don't like things that challenge their ideas and authority. They're fearful of change, and so they don't like people rocking their boat, the boat of the mindless collective, and asserting all their natural rights. Instead, they mainly seek to control governmental resources and maintain governmental influence regarding the lives and property of everyone else. Many in politics are busybodies, or so-called do-gooders, people who relish involving themselves in any issue that hints of community standards or public health, or the needs of our children, and so on. Obviously, people in the private sector who are involved in these issues demonstrate much better ways to achieve similar goals, to the extent that they do in today's statist environment. Most political officials are champions of a particular pet cause that further diminishes individual rights. Nearly all are wholeheartedly opposed to changing the way politics works, let alone getting rid of it entirely. They simply don't envision better alternatives. They see paychecks and short-term goals, which means dropping the context in which they're working, a coercive, unjust monopoly funded with stolen wealth. People who champion the cause of freedom and voluntarism continually remind them of this context. As noted, given the vested interests that maintain the status quo, to play the political and legal game by its absurd rules can't result in respect for individuals and a free market. After all, Running for elected office as a saboteur, or trying to get a bill passed to repeal state power and restore various rights, or making a solid case in court to a judge about why the state has no jurisdiction, not to mention can't provide a fair trial, and isn't a complaining party, assuming he'll let you present such a case, 
or informing a jury of their right, even obligation, to nullify bad laws, all have been frustrating, if not futile, activities for most libertarians in states throughout America. Even though the last activity, jury nullification, seems most promising, especially for the Free State Project, each of these activities is a bit like trying to explain a global positioning system to those who resolutely want to believe that the earth is flat. We not only speak a different language, we also don't share the same premises. So, we must discover ways to build bridges across this premise gap. The challenge is to motivate people, via the court of public opinion, to accept the idea of complete liberty and its implications for politics. This is why strength in numbers is key, why concentration of individual efforts is the best hope. The quest for complete liberty essentially begins and ends in the minds of enlightened individuals. The majority of people in a particular region must be informed of and shown a better way to live. We must teach the language of liberty to young, inquisitive, and resilient minds, regardless of their actual ages. We must introduce sound premises and principles to persons who are suspicious of, or have chosen not to involve themselves in, politics as usual. This is the primary way to alter the political theater. Nonetheless, the sky's the limit as to how to effectively discontinue federal, state, and local interference in the marketplace. Each FSP member is left to his or her own ingenuity and innovativeness to effect changes. Being decentralized and non-hierarchical, the Free State Project represents the best in the American entrepreneurial spirit of independence and resourcefulness. The virtues of self-initiative, self-responsibility, self-reliance, honesty, and self-trust all reflect a fundamental trust in others to live similarly, as well as a distrust in the mindless collective. Dissolution of the state's government will happen when it's no longer granted legitimacy by most people, and when viable free market alternatives are offered. To this end, like-minded free staters and others will develop specific strategies to facilitate market solutions as well as expose the illegitimacy of the state. They'll basically inform their communities about the merits of voluntarism and the demerits of coercion. Aggression typically only begets more aggression in politics. Especially in today's cultural climate, any retaliation against the force initiated by state officials tends to legitimize and increase their violent actions, even though self-defense against a potentially lethal attack remains a fundamental right. For better or worse, long gone are the days of tarring and feathering tax collectors and their assorted comrades. Therefore, strictly non-violent activism will directly promote the goal of complete liberty. Reasonable people best recognize unjust laws and their immoral enforcement when officials harass and arrest those who've harmed no one and violated no one's property rights. Peaceful protests and demonstrations, civil disobedience, nonconformity, and noncompliance in relation to taxes, unjust laws, and regulations are all powerful forms of activism. In addition, by combining activism with explanations of free market alternatives and voluntary solutions, we can open new avenues for understanding and change in communities. Currently, the particular free staters who are most inclined to agree with these ideas, that is, who see no valid reason to play politics, live in the Keene area, which is in southwestern New Hampshire. Keene is a city of over 20,000 people and is the home of Keene State College, the state's largest liberal arts university, which serves approximately 5,000 students. Being a city instead of a town, it's more legally tied to state government. Therein lies one of its challenges. Visit the forum on nhfree.com for further information and details about all the liberty lovers there and their admirable activism. Another approach to activism, though certainly down the road a few years, is to build a complete liberty town from scratch. Imagine what a tourist attraction that would be. The first ever town in the United States with an advanced community of trade and commerce that respects the freedoms of its residents. Instead of being located in some distant part of the third world with the accompanying economic and geopolitical drawbacks, such a town would be in the main birthplace of liberty. For those who've read Ayn Rand's magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged, envision a Galt's Gulch for all to see and visit and emulate. After all, what's achieved in New Hampshire will be a great example for the rest of America and the world. In order to have complete liberty in our lifetime, 
We must commit ourselves to the idea that nothing else is proper for us, beings who own ourselves and flourish by means of reason. Let's now end with the eloquent words of a man who died long ago, but who knew how powerful an idea can be, especially one whose time has come. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. December twenty third, seventeen seventy six, Thomas Paine, The Crisis. This concludes the last chapter of Complete Liberty. What follows is the addendum. Important IAQ: Infrequently asked questions. Is it necessary to move to New Hampshire in order to achieve complete liberty? What if I can't move or simply don't want to for a variety of personal reasons? This pertains to the issue of herding libertarian cats, does it not? Some say that most libertarians are too independent to pick up and move across the country in order to join a movement that involves taking a stand against oppressive government. Given that the Free State Project only has just over a third of the signers needed to initiate their relocation to New Hampshire, this may well be true. So, if you really enjoy living where you are, then by all means don't sacrifice that enjoyment. Instead, start a movement where you reside presently. Ideally, each of us should pick a place in America where we would most like to experience complete liberty, and then get to work on achieving it there. This book has been about the demise of the state on all levels. And the rise of voluntary America, not just voluntary New Hampshire, all will not be lost if you don't move. You won't be enveloped in unstoppable tyranny outside the status borders of New Hampshire, as mentioned in Chapter Ten. Although this state is relatively freer in some aspects, it's currently fraught with the same governmental ills as the rest of the Union. We can't escape the culture, after all, with its assorted themes of authoritarianism, sacrifice, and collectivism. Of course, we could all just move to a deserted island in the South Pacific and have complete liberty there. But honing our survival skills isn't what we're trying to achieve. When I wrote that focused effort by liberty-minded activists in New Hampshire is much better than scattered effort across a whole nation, I did so from the standpoint of what's been happening, or rather, not been happening, in the various states, instead of from the standpoint of future possibilities. Things tend to change over time. For example, the Free State Wyoming project is now underway. FreeStateWyoming.org. Just as each state has its own advantages and disadvantages, each project will too. There are no large cities in New Hampshire or in Wyoming, which might make it easier to change things for the better. On the other hand, a free town in a rural area will offer fewer noticeable economic benefits than a free large city in a cosmopolitan area. Ultimately, it's probably best to choose a place that reflects your preferences for lifestyle, job opportunities, cultural activities, and so on. How many libertarians throughout America actually believe in complete liberty? I've seen no good surveys about this. In my own experience, I would guess somewhere between ten and thirty percent, though it could be higher. Throughout my time in New Hampshire over the past year, it appears that free staters are similarly constituted. Given that complete liberty is based on correct premises about human nature and economics, as well as about the nature of government, the percentages can indeed change. In addition to gaining knowledge about complete liberty, it's crucial that individuals address their particular fears about dispensing with statism, the negative psychological dynamics operating in our culture and on our emotions can hinder full clarity in these matters. This leads to the next all-important question. Will most free staters in New Hampshire eventually direct their focus to achieving complete liberty instead of minimal government? The answer to this depends on how many free staters determine that playing politics isn't a viable strategy for upholding our rights. This question certainly touches on the FSP's statement of intent, which says nothing about getting rid of government entirely, but rather that civil government's maximum role is to protect life, liberty, and property. As previously noted in Chapter Ten. 
civil government is as contradictory as a free state. The classical liberal idea that small government is beautiful tends to contribute to our predicament, for it concedes the premise of statism to the enemies of freedom. As a direct consequence, the vital and essential message of self-ownership becomes de-emphasized or ignored altogether. The actions of some free staters who believe in complete liberty have been criticized mostly by those who believe in representative, albeit constitutionally limited, government, and or by those who simply believe that everyone should abide by the state's rules for changing itself. Some believe that the law must be obeyed, regardless of its infringement on individual rights, typically because they feel that the personal or societal consequences for disobeying it are too dire. We are back to our fears once again. Unlike the heroic characters in Atlas Shrugged, we have no magnificent place designed especially for us by a man named John Galt. Who is John Galt? In essence, he's a man who couldn't tolerate living in a defective and disrespectful society, so he went on strike. He withdrew his productive mind from that society, convinced others to do likewise, and created a place that would function respectfully in accordance with the rights of individuals. Galt's Gulch was a place of honor that showed reverence for the human spirit, the American spirit. You too may be somewhat on strike, like I have been most of my adult life, searching for a particular lever with which to move the world in a more enlightened direction, or at least trying to avoid the worst forms of our highly regulated and taxed mixed economy. Of course, the longer we remain on strike, the more pressing the need for cultural change becomes. Our precious lives may start to feel like they're slipping by. On the other hand, many of you may not see the point in going on strike, and I understand that. But I also understand that neither you nor I can fully escape the web of statist intervention and status quo institutions that restrict our capacities and impede our achievements on a daily basis. None of us truly desires to live a life of quiet desperation, like Dagny Taggart and Hank Reardon would have done, had it not been for the persuasive influence of Galt as well as Francisco D'Anconia. The key thing to remember, and to remind others, is that we all could be living so much better lives, more fulfilling, enriching, and opportunity-filled lives, if we had complete liberty. Therefore, there's no substitute for explicitly promoting it to everyone. Our fellow Americans can handle the truth in these matters, especially when it's presented appropriately to their specific context. After all, if our neighbors don't recognize their own freedoms to be autonomous decision-makers, they'll continue to play politics and or apathetically watch the state's law enforcers inflict pain and suffering on innocent people. In many respects, it's more than the institutions of the state that we're up against. It's the viewpoints of everyone around us. Thus, the next question. Isn't wanting to change the present system and people's ideas about government putting the political trailer in front of the philosophical truck? In other words, aren't people unprepared for such major social, political, and economic changes given their present philosophical ideas and accompanying fears? There are many factors involved in this question, to be sure. Typically, big O objectivists immediately answer yes to it, which is in line with their general disdain for promoting political ideas outside their proper ethical, epistemological, and metaphysical context. Yet, such principles as self-ownership and property rights don't necessarily require a course in objective philosophy. Most intellectuals don't have to become objectivists in order for radical political change to occur. In fact, objectivism's political branch essentially favors the structure of the state over complete liberty, thus opposing radical change. So long as government runs the educational system, ideas counterproductive to liberty will continue to be mainstream, and better ideas will be lost to all but a minority of curious minds. However, paradigm shifts don't happen because people wait around for them to happen. That is, wait around for other people to change their minds and behaviors. Motivated people seek ways to make things happen. John Galt's job was easier than ours, by the way. He just had to convince other productive individuals to withdraw their sanction by moving to a place free of any tyranny. We, however, can't just leave our troubled world behind to fend for itself, while we live in total freedom. We must find ways to change this unfree world. I invite you to join the forum at completeliberty.com, which will be dedicated strictly to brainstorming ways to do this, to achieve complete liberty as quickly as humanly possible. And drumroll please. Do you think that the process of achieving complete liberty entails preparing oneself to do jail time? Most libertarians, for a variety of good reasons, believe this to be the scariest proposition. 
Consequently, throughout America, millions of libertarians continue to live reasonably good, law-abiding lives, just like those who agree, more or less, with the political status quo, as well as those who actively promote it. But must a reasonably good life come at the cost of submitting to governmental employees' demands that you sacrifice your choices, actions, and property? Is living among people who will unleash egregious rights violations upon you if you don't follow their irrational orders any way to live? Is there any reasonable aspect to this living environment? For that matter, is it a proper place in which to rear children? Obedience to unjust authority should never be the price that any rights-respecting person has to pay in order to live outside a jail cell. This bears an Ayn Rand's discussion of sanction of the victim. Essentially, we allow governmental officials to threaten us and coerce us, while we try to peacefully live among them and pursue our own goals. As I've outlined, such conformity only begets more of the same, more of the game wherein governmental officials pretend to be our protectors. And we pretend not to be their dupes and slaves. Spooner's words are indeed accurate. No rational person in a free market who assumed the responsibility of being your protector would even so much as think about gunning you down without mercy if you tried to defend yourself and your property. Of course, the more we engage in pleasurable activities, the more we can evade this issue. In many ways, the American way of life tends to ignore the eternal problems of politics and the pervasive obedience to authority arising from it, or giving rise to it. The causation is indeed reciprocal. Oftentimes, there are just too many cool places to go, great people to see, and fun things to do to really motivate us to focus on the nature of our political plight. But huge problems remain, irrespective of how carefully we follow the state's rules. Tax time. Victimless crimes, police harassment, regulatory nightmares in business and personal life, horrendous effects of fiat currency, death and suffering in semi-socialized healthcare, and so on. These are not things to be overlooked by people who genuinely believe in the pursuit of happiness. I've had many discussions about this issue with my friend Russell Canning of the Keen Free Press, who once again is in a small jail cell as I type these words. Basically, on account of choosing not to obtain the state-required official documents in order to drive his car on the monopolized roads of government, once again he's harmed no one and violated no one's property rights. Thus, there's no tort, no complaining party, and the government has no standing. In addition to no legitimacy, exposing the government's violent racket by not conforming to its edicts is Russell's way of leading people to see the essential truth in these matters. Russell is a libertarian doer. He walks the talk. To the extent that we continue to conform to the government's irrational, immoral, and unjust demands, we are only libertarian talkers, as Russell has good-naturedly remarked on various occasions. Yet millions of libertarian talkers could dramatically alter the course of human history by becoming libertarian doers as well, especially at the same time and in an orchestrated fashion. We have two choices, as I see it. Either comply and enable further oppressive acts, or start demanding that our rights be respected. The state's coercive behavior will come to an abrupt end when more and more people decide not to tolerate a shred of subjugation. This is how an undignified civilization can transform itself into a dignified one. Ultimately, each of us must decide when it's necessary and feasible to stop enabling our oppressors. Most of us have lifestyles in which being put in a cage for an extended length of time would result in a lot of personal turmoil and financial losses. This partially explains how our oppressors get away with their despicable actions through creating fear of losing the rest of our freedoms. So each of us must pick our particular issues and protest and disobey in the way that minimizes as much as possible the negative impact on our own lives and families. Many libertarians are in cages throughout America for no valid reason, alongside hundreds of thousands who are also victims of unjust laws and their contemptible enforcement. It's time to start encouraging our fellow Americans to help us put a stop to these abominations. In doing so, we should look to and depend on each other, the free market, rather than the corrupt tools of government, to bring about wholesome changes. Whether this will eventually entail flooding the statist jail cells, one can only speculate. In this day and age, there's no greater deed than exposing the violent nature of the organization known as government, which means showing people the gun in the room, as Stefan Molyneux has put it, freedomainradio.com. 
Of course, the gun remains in its holster when we comply. In contrast, the tax case of the brave Plainfield, New Hampshire residents Ed and Elaine Brown have amply exposed the guns of the IRS, Federal District Court, and U.S. Marshals. Staunch resistance to their demands directly threatens their perverse way of life. Ultimately, the most important thing is to introduce people to the principles of complete liberty in a fashion that you believe is best in your context. And the sooner we can create a voluntary America, the sooner we can pursue our happiness, unfettered by the ills of the state. This concludes Complete Liberty Podcast number 10, and thus the whole audiobook. I appreciate you listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to purchase the softcover copy of this book, just go to the website completeliberty.com, and there'll be a link there to the books page on lulu.com. You can also download the entire book in PDF file format from the website. Again, if you have any questions or comments, just email me at wes at completeliberty.com. And stay tuned for future Complete Liberty podcasts, which I hope to do in a half an hour format on a weekly basis. It'll basically feature news, commentary, and analysis, and probably responses to your emails, as well as a guest or two down the road. And once again, CompleteLiberty.com has a link to the Libsyn page that has the show notes for these podcasts and information about the electronic music that I've been using for the bumpers.